The Truth About Angels, Chapter 8 Angels at the Time of the Exodus The Birth of Moses As time rolled on, Joseph, the great man to whom Egypt owed so much, passed to the grave. And there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Orders were issued to destroy the Hebrew male children at their birth. Satan was the mover in this matter. He knew that a deliverer was to be raised up among the Israelites, and by leading the king to destroy their children, he hoped to defeat the divine purpose. While this decree was in full force, a son was born to Amram and Jochebed. The mother succeeded in concealing the child, Moses, for three months. Then, finding that she could no longer keep him safely, she prepared a little ark of rushes, making it watertight by means of slime and pitch. And laying the babe therein, she placed it among the flags at the river's brink. She dared not remain to guard it, lest the child's life and her own should be forfeited. But his sister Miriam lingered near, anxiously watching to see what would become of her little brother. And there were other watchers. The mother's earnest prayers had committed her child to the care of God. And angels, unseen, hovered above his lowly resting place. Angels directed Pharaoh's daughter thither. Her curiosity was excited by the little basket, and as she looked upon the beautiful child within, she read the story at a glance. The tears of the babe awakened her compassion, and she determined that he should be saved. She would adopt him as her own. The elders of Israel were taught by angels that the time for their deliverance was near, and that Moses was the man whom God would employ to accomplish this work. Angels instructed Moses also that Jehovah had chosen him to break the bondage of his people. He, supposing that they were to obtain their freedom by force of arms, expected to lead the Hebrew host against the armies of Egypt. Moses remained at court until he was forty years of age. One day, while thus abroad, seeing an Egyptian smiting an Israelite, he sprung forward and slew the Egyptian and immediately buried the body in the sand. Moses made his escape and fled toward Arabia. After a time, Moses married one of the daughters of Jethro, and here, in the service of his father-in-law, as keeper of his flocks, he remained forty years. Moses in Midian Could his, Moses, eyes have been opened? He would have seen the messengers of God, pure, holy angels bending lovingly over him, shedding their light around him. While engaged in his round of duties, he, Moses, saw a bush, branches, foliage, and trunk all burning, yet not consumed. He drew near to view the wonderful sight when a voice addressed him from out of the flame. It was the voice of God. It was he who, as the angel of the covenant, had revealed himself to the fathers in ages past. The frame of Moses quivered. He was thrilled with terror as the Lord called him by name. With trembling lips he answered, Here am I. He was warned not to approach his Creator with undue familiarity. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. With his wife and children, Moses set forth on the journey to Egypt. On the way from Midian, Moses received a startling and terrible warning of the Lord's displeasure. An angel appeared to him in a threatening manner, as if he would immediately destroy him. No explanation was given, but Moses remembered that he had disregarded one of God's requirements. Yielding to the persuasion of his wife, he had neglected to perform the rite of circumcision upon their youngest son. 
he had failed to comply with the condition by which his child could be entitled to the blessings of God's covenant with Israel. Zipporah, fearing that her husband would be slain, performed the rite herself, and the angel then permitted Moses to pursue his journey. In his mission to Pharaoh, Moses was to be placed in a position of great peril. His life could be preserved only through the protection of holy angels. But while living in neglect of a known duty, he would not be secure, for he could not be shielded by the angels of God. Aaron, being instructed by angels, went forth to meet his brother, from whom he had been so long separated. And they met amid the desert solitudes, near Horeb. Together they journeyed to Egypt. And having reached the land of Goshen, they proceeded to assemble the elders of Israel. The Plagues of Egypt Moses and Aaron were God's representatives to a bold, defiant king, and to impenitent priests, hardened in rebellion, who had allied themselves to evil angels. Pharaoh and the great men of Egypt were not ignorant in regard to the wise government of God. A bright light had been shining through the ages, pointing to God, to His righteous government, and to the claims of His law. Joseph and the children of Israel in Egypt had made known the knowledge of God. Even after the people of Israel had been brought into bondage to the Egyptians, not all were regarded as slaves. Many were placed in important positions, and these were witnesses for God. Satan well knew that Moses was chosen of God to break the yoke of bondage upon the children of Israel. He consulted with his angels how to accomplish a work which should answer a twofold purpose. One, to destroy the influence of the work wrought by God through his servant Moses, by working through his agents and thus counterfeiting the true work of God. Two, to exert an influence by his work through the magicians, which would reach down through all ages and destroy in the minds of many true faith in the mighty miracles and works to be performed by Christ when he should come to this world. Moses and Aaron entered the lordly halls of the king of Egypt. There, before the monarch of the most powerful kingdom then in existence, stood the two representatives of the enslaved race to repeat the command from God for Israel's release. The king demanded a miracle, in evidence of their divine commission. Aaron now took the rod and cast it down before Pharaoh. It became a serpent. The monarch sent for his wise men and the sorcerers, who cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. The magicians did not really cause their rods to become serpents. But by magic, aided by the great deceiver, they were able to produce this appearance. It was beyond the power of Satan to change the rods to living serpents. The prince of evil, though possessing all the wisdom and might of an fallen angel, has not power to create or to give life. This is the prerogative of God alone. But all that was in Satan's power to do, he did. He produced a counterfeit. To human sight, the rods were changed to serpents. There was nothing in their appearance to distinguish them from the serpent produced by Moses. Though the Lord caused the real serpent to swallow up the spurious ones, yet this was regarded by Pharaoh not as a work of God's power, but as the result of a kind of magic superior to that of his servants. Pharaoh desired to justify his stubbornness in resisting the divine command and hence he was seeking some pretext for disregarding the miracles that God had wrought through Moses. Satan gave him just what he wanted. By the work that he wrought through the magicians, he made it appear to the Egyptians that Moses and Aaron were only magicians and sorcerers, and that the message they brought could not claim respect as coming from a superior being. Thus, Satan's counterfeit accomplished its purpose of emboldening the Egyptians in their rebellion and causing Pharaoh to harden his heart against conviction. Satan hoped also 
to shake the faith of Moses and Aaron in the divine origin of their mission. When the miracles were wrought before the king, Satan was on the ground to counteract their influence and prevent Pharaoh from acknowledging the supremacy of God and obeying his mandate. Satan wrought to the utmost of his power to counterfeit the work of God and resist his will. The only result was to prepare the way for greater exhibitions of the divine power and glory, and to make more apparent, both to the Israelites and to all Egypt, the existence and sovereignty of the true and living God. The storm, the seventh plague, came on the morrow as predicted, thunder and hail, and fire mingled with it, destroying every herb, shattering trees, and smiting man and beast. Hitherto none of the lives of the Egyptians had been taken, but now death and desolation followed in the track of the destroying angel. The land of Goshen alone was spared. The Lord, through Moses, gave direction to the children of Israel concerning their departure from Egypt, and especially for their preservation from the coming judgment. Each family, alone or in connection with others, was to slay a lamb or a kid without blemish, and with a bunch of hyssop sprinkle its blood on the two side posts and on the upper doorpost of the house, that the destroying angel, coming at midnight, might not enter that dwelling. The Lord declared, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you. The children of Israel had followed the directions given them of God. And while the angel of death was passing from house to house among the Egyptians, they were all ready for their journey. About midnight, Every Egyptian household was aroused from their sleep by the cry of pain. They feared they were all to die. They remembered when the cry of distress and mourning was heard from the Hebrews because of the inhuman decree of a cruel king to slay all their male infants as soon as they were born. The Egyptians could not see the avenging angel who entered every house and dealt the death blow but they knew that it was the Hebrews' God who was causing them to suffer the same distress they had made the Israelites to suffer. Christ, Israel's invisible leader. In Egypt the report was spread that the children of Israel were pressing on toward the Red Sea. Pharaoh collected his forces and, attended by the great men of his realm, headed the attacking army. The Hebrews were encamped beside the sea. Suddenly they beheld in the distance the flashing armor and moving chariots betokening the advance guard of a great army. Terror filled the hearts of Israel. Some cried unto the Lord, but the far greater part hastened to Moses with their complaints. His calm and assuring reply to the people was, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The wonderful pillar of cloud had been followed as the signal of God to go forward. But now they questioned among themselves if it might not foreshadow some great calamity. For had it not led them on the wrong side of the mountain into an impassable way? Thus the angel of God appeared to their deluded minds as the harbinger of disaster. But now, as the Egyptian host approached them, expecting to make them an easy prey, the cloudy column rose majestically into the heavens, passed over the Israelites, and descended between them and the armies of Egypt. A wall of darkness interposed between the pursued and their pursuers. The Egyptians could no longer discern the camp of the Hebrews and were forced to halt. But as the darkness of night deepened, the wall of cloud became a great light to the Hebrews flooding the entire encampment with the radiance of day. Then hope returned to the hearts of Israel, and Moses lifted up his voice unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. 
but lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. The Egyptians pursued, and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass, that in the morning watch the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud, and troubled the host of the Egyptians. Angels of God went through their host and removed their chariot wheels. The Egyptians were seized with confusion and dismay. They endeavored to retrace their steps and flee to the shore they had quitted. But Moses stretched out his rod, and the piled-up waters, hissing, roaring, and eager for their prey, rushed together and swallowed the Egyptian army in their black depths. The leader of the Israelites was a mighty general of armies. His angels, that do his bidding, walked on either side of the vast armies of Israel, and no harm could come to them. Israel was safe. Then came the sacred song of triumph, led by Miriam. Jesus was the angel enshrouded in the pillar of cloud by day, and the pillar of fire by night.